Well, I've just been introduced. Uh, I am uh, Hoshino. I have, uh, actually, I believe that this is the third time that I've had the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you very, very much for these repeated opportunities. So we're very limited for time, so I'd like to get into uh, the heart of the matter as quickly as possible. As you know, on December 16th, in regard to the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant uh, belonging to TEPCO, uh, we announced that it had achieved the uh, condition equivalent to a cold shutdown. In regard to the technical details, I would like to ask Mr. Aizawa to uh, explain that later. Um, on December 16th, we, in other words, announced that we had completed step two of our roadmap to bringing a resolution uh, to this uh, nuclear power plant accident. What we mean uh, by uh, bringing to a conclusion uh, is uh, that we will, not, we will be able to avert a situation where we again have to ask people around the area to evacuate. In other words, we will be able to avert a situation where we uh, place the people of Fukushima uh, where they have to face a great deal of fear. Yes, no. I would like, however, to um, make myself very, very clear. I do not want to invite any misunderstandings. Uh, in other words, I know that there are many, many challenges still facing us, and I would like to approach them from two different uh, viewpoints. Uh, the first viewpoint is that we understand that there is a very long process awaiting us of perhaps 30 to 40 years. That is how long it will take to decommission uh, the uh, nuclear reactors. There are many, many challenges that are going to face us along this way. We are, of course, uh, in the process of putting together a roadmap to achieve uh, the final decommissioning of these reactors. We understand, of course, that there are going to be many, many problems that we will encounter along the way. Uh, however, what I'm saying is that we are also going to be putting together, and we have already uh, found fundamentally put together, uh, many, many measures to deal with each of these problems as they arise. What I've been saying so far is uh, about everything that is uh, on site, in other words, uh, around the nuclear power plant itself. However, from another viewpoint, we see that there are many, many other challenges that remain, and these refer to the problems off site, in, that, in other words, um, around uh, the uh, nuclear power plant facility itself. We know that there are many, many uh, challenges facing us, and these are challenges that we, as the Japanese government, must face uh, head on or directly. Uh, we understand that outside or off-site of the uh, nuclear power plant itself, uh, the, the situation has not come to any kind of a conclusion yet. To these um, off-site challenges that we face, I would like to explain in more detail in a few moments. But before that, I would like to uh, spend a moment uh, to uh, explain to you um, how we have actually been able to achieve this current situation. In other words, we have achieved uh, the step two targets. The only way that we were able to get to this uh, situation is because of the incredible efforts of the people who are working on site. On December 17th, uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, the site and to spend some time actually talking with uh, the people who worked uh, at the power plant. Uh, over the past few months, I have, of course, uh, as a part of my work, had many opportunities to visit uh, Fukushima, and I have visited uh, inside of the facilities, but because of the fact that I was very limited for time, because of the fact that the uh, workers themselves were under great uh, psychological stress, we really never had an opportunity to just sit down and talk. This was the first time. Uh, there were seven uh, persons uh, that I met with originally, and uh, of the uh, seven people, uh, the first to open his mouth and speak was a man in his 50s. He told, us, he told me about um, how uh, he had become uh, involved uh, in this work after the accident. Uh, for the first four de five days immediately after the accident, he was not able to uh, contact his family at all. Uh, he obviously, uh, he spoke about these matters uh, in a very, very calm, uh, sort of expressionless way. Uh, and saying that uh, he expended all of his energies uh, not searching for his family but trying to bring the accident to some kind of a resolution. When one thinks, however, about his psychological state and what thoughts must have been running through his head, it's only natural to assume that he wanted to abandon his work and go and look for his family. But the fact that he pushed down his own feelings, suppressed his own feelings and worked is something uh, that uh, is left a tremendous memory uh, in my heart. In fact, uh, when one speaks with many of the workers on site, one realizes uh, that uh, the workers, uh, they, that a high proportion of the workers actually are people who uh, live or are from around that area. In other words, uh, they were working so hard to deal with the aftermath of the accident, and their, the driving um, reason uh, for their efforts lay in the fact that they wanted to be able to uh, rescue uh, their uh, families and their friends from this uh, terrible situation as quickly as possible. Of uh, the seven people that I met with, another uh, man uh, made a, left a very, very strong impression on me. He was uh, 29 years old, the youngest uh, of this group. And he spoke about his experiences and his feelings uh, of what happened on uh, May 10th.
May 10th is a date that many of you also may remember. Um, I remember it very, very well because it was the day, the first day after the accident occurred, since the accident occurred, that a person, a worker, was able to step inside the premises of the uh, nuclear power plant facility itself, in other words, the reactor buildings. He was chosen uh, as the representative of all the workers to take that first step inside the building. And when he spoke about his experiences, he, thought, he said that he thought to himself, if not me, then who? Since uh, March 11th, we have uh, undertaken many, many different initiatives. Uh, we know that uh, in regard to many of these actions that we've taken, uh, some of you have taken very, very critical um, uh, attitudes toward. I understand this, and I understand that in regard to the current situation in Fukushima at the nuclear power plant, we know that we have received a wide variety of assessments, uh, and I'm very, very aware of that as well. However, I would like to take this opportunity to say to you that uh, the fact that we have gotten to this point, and this, what I mean by this point is uh, that we have reached the uh, conclusion of step two according to our roadmap we have reached uh, what we consider to be uh a, a situation of, of closure for the on-site uh, accident uh, facilities. What I mean by that is that we will not, we have been able to reach a situation where we will not have to evacuate people from around the facility. The fact that we have gotten to this point really is due to the uh, incredible work of these workers and I wanted to bring this to your attention. Uh, in regard to uh, some of the things that I've spoken to you about, uh, we are releasing uh, f video footage about uh, the workers and their um, situation, uh, not only on our government website, but also on TEPCO's homepage. Uh, we are also working on creating a Japan an English translation of uh, these uh, visual images, and so we hope that you will please be able to see uh, these um, videos and uh, these other materials as quickly as possible. Please understand uh, how hard they have worked. Website. Correction, it is not the government website, it is my own personal website that I'm speaking of. <laughs> the TEPCO website and my own personal website. Uh, so I would like to basically conclude uh, my remarks here and I, in regard to what has happened at uh, the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant. What I would like to also to bring to your attention is the fact that we at Fukushima are entering a new phase. Uh, one uh, thing that uh, I can uh, say with great certainty is that uh, the re as a result of our activities at Fukushima, uh, we are going to be establishing on the, found, on the basis of uh, the, our activities at Fukushima new world standards in regard to safety. Excuse me, excuse me. Um, not a foundation, but rather we're going to be uh, creating a sort of training facility uh, to, uh, to study new safety standards. <laughs> it's going to be like a, a dojo, as in uh, the uh, Japanese martial arts, as in uh, karate, etc. And it's simply not a training center where you sit in a suit, but apparently uh, you uh, receive an, both mental and spiritual, as well as intellectual training. In other words, what we are trying to envision uh, is a, a dojo or a facility or a, a system or initiative in which we can invite uh, people from around the world uh, who are involved in uh, nuclear power or nuclear um, science. Uh, there they will be able uh, not only to receive a great deal of information, but also they will be able to visit uh, inside, inside the facilities. Uh, they will be able to see with their own eyes exactly what happened at Fukushima. They will also be able to contemplate together what exactly uh, Japan lacked in terms of an adequate response. Uh, we hope to be able to put together uh, this initiative or this facility as quickly as possible. Uh, this is going to be one of the uh, key elements of the new uh, nuclear safety related um, initiatives that we are launching in April. The thing uh, that we are considering for Fukushima is that we would like for this to become a, a center where uh, people can research uh, decontamination and also uh, research the uh, low-level medical uh, radiation treatments uh, that are a very, very interesting uh, field for the future. As you may know, uh, the uh, soon to be established a nuclear safety agency uh, is within part of the uh, Ministry of Environment, of which I serve as minister, has been designated as the agency that will be in charge of researching uh, radio, uh, radiological, excuse me, radio, using radiology, excuse me, uh, in, in, med in medical treatments. We also know that uh, Fukushima is now going to be entering uh, its next uh, stage uh, in dealing with this accident, and that is uh, the step towards uh, decommissioning uh, the reactors. This is going to be an extremely complex and crucial and very difficult process, and as a result, uh, we will hope that uh, Fukushima will eventually become a center for research and uh, development of technology that has to do with unmanned uh, decommissioning-related technology. 
Um, I believe that you know this, uh, or maybe there is not enough information about this, but since uh, March 11th, uh, we have seen uh, Japanese unmanned technology uh, being used in very, very uh, great ways. For example, uh, Komatsu, uh, the equipment manufacturer, has had uh, construction-related equipment uh, that is uh, not manned, in other words, that is um, autonomous, uh, which has been very, very helpful in collecting debris. Uh, as a result of collecting debris, uh, the work uh, surrounding the plant was able to uh, proceed much, much more smoothly than might otherwise have been possible. Uh, we know that uh, in Shanghai, Shanghai Bampe, uh, we know that uh, unmanned uh, robotic technology has gained uh, great attention in other areas. For example, there was an exposition in Shanghai uh, recently where a Japanese robot was able to play the violin. Uh, although this was wonderful technology, there was great criticism that if a robot can play the violin, maybe you should use more robots to go inside the nuclear facility to help bring this accident to a closure. I mentioned earlier, the decommissioning work is going to be a very long-term process requiring 30 to 40 years. And since uh, part of the decommissioning uh, process requires the moving of fuel, uh, nuclear fuel, uh, much of this will have to be done using unmanned uh, technology. By unmanned technology, I, I could refer to this as basically robotic technology. Uh, in regard to research and development of new uh, technologies in this field, I would certainly like to ask for advice and guidance from uh, experts from around the world. But at the same time, Time, we would like to firmly put together a system in Japan where we, on our own, uh, develop a unique uh, technology uh, in this field. In other words, I want to have robotic technology that is very much made in Japan. In regard to uh, the off-site uh, works initiatives that I've been talking about, uh, one area that I have uh, greatest faith in and greatest uh, hope in uh, is in regard to the uh, medical uses of uh, uh, radioactivity, in other words, using low, revel uh, low levels of radiation uh, in medical treatments. Uh, in this regard, we have established a working group of experts. Uh, we have already met eight times uh, since November when this working group was established. Each time we meet for about two hours. I believe this uh, theme uh, to be extremely, extremely important. In spite of the fact that I have many, many responsibilities, I have put the, uh, these meetings of these experts to be of the highest priority, and I have therefore been able to um, attend every single meeting that we've had. What do we do at these meetings? We discuss the potential uh, areas for uh, research and we put together, uh, or we are putting together some ideas on how to uh, move forward with this research. What are some of the things uh, that we have been talking about among these experts? Uh, one has to do with the fact that uh, in regard to, uh, one has to do with the um, details of radiation exposure and what uh, are some of the effects of a very high doses of radiation exposure. In regard to radiation exposure that uh, goes over, uh, that crosses 100 millisieverts, uh, there is uh, data available uh, from uh, victims of uh, nuclear bombs, atomic bombs in the past. And it has the conclusion that experts have drawn from looking at this data is that there is a certain uh, increase in the risks of contracting uh, cancer during one's lifetime. To be very, very precise, if one receives more than 100 millisieverts of radiation exposure, then uh, there is, uh, throughout one's life, uh, an increase of 0.5% the likelihood that you might die from, uh, this, uh, from cancer. Uh, however, in regard to exposure uh, that is less than 100 millisieverts, uh, there are uh, no, there's, n there's not enough uh, studies uh, that identify uh, the potential risks. In other words, it may be that uh, there may be increased risks of contracting cancer or dying from cancer, but that data has more or less been hidden by other um, factors that also cause cancer as well. In other words, the uh, conclusion is that there is no absolute data, clear data, that shows that there is any increased risk of contracting cancer or dying from cancer from exposure that is below 100 millisieverts. However, um, I do not believe it is appropriate, we do not believe that it is appropriate uh, to uh, compare uh, the uh, the risks associated with um, radiation exposure from the nuclear power plant accident to radiation exposure, excuse me, cancer risks that you get from other factors in life. The reason for this is in regard to other fa risk factors for cancer, people have a choice as to whether they might subject themselves to such risks. Uh, in the case of the people who have to live in Fukushima Prefecture or around uh, that uh, area, they have no choice in the matter because they are living there, they are subjected to this risk. え、ただ